something different. I next week I, I I might do another one on Noah's Ark, but it'll be different uh, than than the focus on this. This is called Gospel Pictures in Noah's Ark because I wanted to kind of show you how Noah's Ark is a type of Christ and the pictures that God has for us there. And we're really we're kind of really expository preaching through this Genesis chapter 6. We're continuing verse by verse here and going through it and learning different things about that and kind of uh, uh, thinking about those things. But the flood, I might, in the afternoon next week, I might show that video that I did, uh, Sights and Sounds of the Worldwide Flood. We might do that in the afternoon uh, because... It was good. It was, it, and it's gripping the 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 account of the flood and everything like that. So that that has visual aids to it, which which give us some good understanding of some things as well. Now that uh, we'll we'll deal with the flood in the afternoon. We might do that instead of having the children's class. We'll do that instead and do some things a little bit different with that. So we have enough time to go through that. But anyway, I think it's powerful. We did it four or five years ago, and um, it, we can still use that. We need to upload uh, a video to sermon audio on that because we've not done that. So next week, if we show that, we'll upload the video, because the video is not on there, only the audio is on there. So we'll reintroduce that as a video on sermon audio. But anyway, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. I like this. This is the hope that we all have in Christ. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Noah found grace. Isn't that something? So, uh, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. We talked about that last week. That's where we ended up, days of Noah, days of violence, right? Uh, days of Noah 2.0, days of violence, I called that. And that's where we dealt with the real violence. And that, that's had an impact on folks. Folks have uh, responded to that and, and said that the Lord is... Uh, you know, use that in their life. Amen. So that's good. That's a blessing. Uh, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence and God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And here's next. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee all the food. I like this. See, God makes provision for everything. We're going to talk about that. Take, and take thou unto thee all, of all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Amen. So he's talked about Genesis 6, uh, verse 13. Um, God speaking of all flesh, right? Ending. That God was going to destroy this world. God talks about them fashioning and them making, Noah fashioning and, and, and Noah making. But the first point that I want to make to you is this. We see, make thee an ark of gopher wood. 
the ark wasn't made out of steel. It wasn't made out of uh, uh, like a battleship, right? It wasn't made out of, and God could have had it made out of anything. Right, he really could have. Right, uh, we they had workers in, and we know that worked with steel. Right, worked with metals. Right, we know that the Bible talks about that. We talked about that, uh, and and things of that nature. Right, but that's not what God decided. What God decided was that it would be made out of uh, of gopher wood, and that wood, what it pictures is the wood of the like the cross. Think about that's the first picture. That that ark was made out of gopher wood because it's a picture of the cross. Right, the trees had to be cut down. Right. They, they, the same thing with the cross. When Jesus, when Jesus was lifted up on the cross, it was a wooden cross that he was lifted up on, right? The Bible speaks of that. Job chapter 14. Look at there. Job chapter 14, verse number 7. For there is hope of a tree. Think about that. That's a picture of the gospel right there. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. That's the gospel, right? Jesus said if a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, right? It, it bringeth forth much fruit. That's what Jesus did, right? Jesus died on that old rugged cross. He died for our sins. He died on that wooden cross, right? And he was buried and he rose again from the dead. And as he rose again from the dead, he gave that resurrection life and that newness of life, right? That ark was a picture of Jesus Christ. It was a picture of redemption. It was a picture that though all the world would, would be flooded and all the world would be, uh, would be destroyed, that God still had a remnant that he would save, right? And that's what that ark is a picture of. That's what we think about when we think about the wood of that ark and we think about the way that God designed it and, and the, 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 the reason he designed it and the reason he used that wood. You know, I like what Matthew Henry said. He said, it's not called a ship for it was not made of, for sailing to any distant parts, but an ark or a chest being like one flat bottomed and ridged and sloping upwards and was made for floating on the waters for a little way. The large floating vessel, vessel in which Noah and his family were preserved during the deluge is called an ark or a chest. By the way, that's Webster 1828. Sorry, uh, not Matthew Henry. But, but um, what he explains here is that it, this wasn't a, like some people claim, well, how were they going to sail that big boat? Well, where were they going to go? The whole world was destroyed, right? God just had, God had an ark or a chest, right? Like we're going to talk about a few different arks in the Bible, but God had that for a reason, right? It wasn't meant to be fancy. It wasn't meant to sail. It was to preserve them. That's like when Christ, when he came, there's nothing like you see this picture of the ark here and it's kind of fancy and it looks very, you know, dramatic and everything like that. And it's, it's kind of captive. But really, when you think of the ark, you think of a chest, you think of a chest that's there and there's nothing fancy about it, right? There's nothing that would allure any man to it, right? In fact, when Noah's building the ark, they're all looking at him like, what are you building a boat for? I mean, it hasn't rained ever on the earth. What are you building this for? And it wasn't something fancy that attracted the world to it, right? It wasn't kind of like a, a worldwide attraction. What was it? Uh, when the water settled back down after the, the earth. Um, the water seeded, yep. And it set back down on the ground. There wasn't like all those braces to hold it up either. It would no. Have been flat so it could have set on the ground. Just set. Yep. Set right there. That's true. And some people have, I mean, Ron Wyatt has some really crazy theories, but we might talk about that next week, but they're, they're not accurate, I don't believe. But anyway, but yes, correct. It was like a chest. That's what it was like. So you think of, when you think of another ark, well, I'll show you pictures of it here. Anyway, it's not called a ship. Uh, let's see. We talked about that already. So here's an ark, right? Uh, let's talk about this one. This was Moses' ark. Right? They, they made an ark of what? Bulrushes, right? And Moses, what is that? It's like a chest, right? It was a chest to hold him inside, right? To hold him inside and to preserve him in the waters until he was found. And then we have a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. This is, this is what uh, Moses made on earth, right? But all that was it was a replica of this one in heaven, right? Um, and because the one in heaven is the authentic one. Some people ask today, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, it's in heaven. The one on earth was destroyed. It was taken. We don't need it. Why? Well, it was modeled and fashioned after the one in heaven. Right? Just like Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus Christ came and God sent him. Right? And he was born of a woman. Right? And he, and he was made like unto sinful flesh, which we'll talk about. Right? The ark was a refuge from divine judgment. 
uh, part of this is taken from A.W. Pink, but there are, four mar there are four arks mentioned in Scripture, and each one of them is a shelter and a place of safety. The Ark of Noah secured those within it from the outpoured wrath of God. God was pouring wrath upon the whole earth, and he put Noah in that ark. It's not called a ship, for it was not made for sailing to any distant parts, which we talked about. The large floating vessel in which Noah and his family were preserved during the deluge is called the Ark of the Chest. The Ark of Bulrushes in Exodus chapter 2 protected the young child Moses from the murderous designs of Pharaoh, who was a type of Satan. Think about that. His mom makes that Ark of Bulrushes, right? Made of that and floats him on that water and sends him out there, right? To... And, and God preserves him through that. The Ark of the Covenant sheltered the two tables of the stone on which were inscribed the Holy Law of God. So in the Ark of the Covenant, you have the Law of God, right? You have the tables of stone uh, inside of that. The, uh, the, each Ark speaks of Christ and putting the four together, we learn that the believer is sheltered from God's wrath, Satan's assaults, and the condemnation of the law. The only three things in all the universe which can threaten or harm us. Think about that. All those Arks, they, they all teach us something. They all teach us something about God's preservation, about God's caring for his people. Really, what does the ark really teach us about God's provision and his care for his people? It also teaches us of God's judgment upon sin. But God preserves his people through anything. God didn't take Noah out of the flood. He preserved Noah through the flood. God is not always going to take you out of the flood, but he'll preserve you through it. The problem is, is when you get in your mind and heart that you're allowed to tell God what he's supposed to do with you dirt while he's protecting you. That you think, God, I think it's a good idea for you just to end the storm and end the floods and, and make it all stop. Well, that's great that you have that good idea in your mind, but that doesn't mean that's the will of God. It may be that the will of God is to preserve you through it. And, and if it is, it's because it's for your own good. If he takes you up out of it, it's because it's for your own good. If he preserves you through it, it's because it's for your own good. Amen. And we all believe that, not because it feels good, but we believe it by faith. Amen. Amen. We believe it by faith. We don't believe it for any other reason, but by faith. Because that's what God told us to do, and we believe God. Amen. So here we have it here. And the fourth ark is the one in heaven in the midst of the throne of God where we are all safe for all of eternity, which we will be one day. Right? That's the final ark. That's the one that's in heaven. That's the one that will come down with the New Jerusalem, right? But that is the throne of God. The Ark of Noah was a place of safety. It was provided by God when death threatened all. It was the only place of deliverance from the wrath to come. My friend, there is a wrath coming of God, and it's the wrath of hell, and it is coming. God is going to judge. God is going to come back. Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he's going to rain down fire and brimstone. He's going to rain down fire from heaven. He's going to burn up his enemies, and he's going to melt the earth with fervent heat. He's going to judge all mankind, and those that names are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to go through the fires of hell, and they are going to stay there for all of eternity. They're going to be, they're going to be dumped into the lake of fire for all of eternity. This is the judgment of God upon sin. God hates sin and God's going to judge sin. But he provided an ark. And that ark is Christ. Amen? What a picture. But God provided an ark. It was the only place of deliverance from the wrath to come. And as such, it speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior of lost sinners. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is our ark. Today, you look, you think about the story of Noah's ark and you think about the truth of that and how God destroyed the whole world. Well, Jesus said he's going to come back again. He's going to destroy the whole world by fire. He's going to do it. If you believe the first story, you better believe the second because it's coming and it's prophetic and God said it was going to happen. But he provided a way of salvation through Jesus Christ. No man will have an excuse, right? Because Jesus Christ is the ark. Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple, the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. 
This is where that ark is. You have all these people. And by the way, you be careful about getting caught up with all these people looking for the Ark of the Covenant and looking for this and looking for that. They had movies about it, Raiders of the Lost Ark and everything else like that, right? And they're looking for the Ark and they say, well, uh, Ron Wyatt has a, a story about the Ark is hidden in the wall and the blood came down and all this other stuff. And I told you all that story years ago, but, but they, that, that that's where it was and it was right below Calvary. God doesn't want you to know where it is. Why? Because if you remember what the Lord said about that ark, the glory hath departed. The glory was done. It was gone. That ark doesn't matter. The ark in heaven is the one that matters. That's Jesus. That's the one that matters. These people are running around looking for all these. They, you don't need to look for that. Say, where is it? It's right there. It's in heaven. That's the ark that matters, right? It's just like, I'll give you a picture of that. It's just like Matthew 24 when they say, lo, here is Christ or there is Christ. Believe them not. Why? We know where Christ is. He's in heaven. And he's, and he's defined in this book. And that's how I know who Jesus Christ is. Amen. So I'm not deceived by these false prophets that arise speaking perverse things to draw men away after them, right? Why? Well, because I know where Jesus is. I know who he is. I know him from the scriptures. That's why people like Fanny Crosby, who's blind, could say, I'll know him by the prints of the nails in his hands, right? Amen. I'll know him. I'll know who he is. It was made from that gopher wood, right? Now, do we know what gopher wood exactly is? Not really. We don't really understand. God never... God never explained that to us or, or showed us. In Noah's time, it would have been very common. In Moses' time, it would have been very common. It probably is common now, but God never told us what it is exactly. We know kind of the family that it comes from by, 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 from of the, by some of the wordage and, and things like that, but that's, it's not really important, to be honest with you. There isn't anything mystical about gopher wood. It's just the wood that God chose to use, right? Amen. Probably God didn't tell you what it was because you'd probably be trying to make little trinkets out of it and sell them for money. Wow. The charismatics would be selling yeah. little arcs made of gopher wood and selling them for money. Right. Sprinkled with holy, unholy water, right? Yeah. And they'd be sending them out there, but you get your piece of gopher wood. <laughs> yeah. I could see it just, couldn't you? Yeah. That's why God don't tell us some things. I'll tell you why. God knows they'll make merchandise of you. They'll make money off you. Right? Amen. Right. Little pieces of bark, right? Sell, selling them. Made out of gopher wood. Well, how do you know it's made out of gopher wood? You don't know, right? But look at this. Who made the trees, though? God made the trees. Christ is God's provision in salvation, and salvation is of the Lord. Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. Listen, God made the trees. God, God told Noah to build it out of those trees, right? You make it out of these trees. You make it out of gopher wood, right? Why? Because God's provision. God provides it. God makes provision. If there's anything that you get today, you should get this, that God provides for his people. God makes provision for his people. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the most wicked things you can do is doubt God's provision for you. Right? Why is that? Because it's, it's not exercising faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you're ever in a trial and you get very perplexed and your mind is very taken and you're, and you're full of anxiety and distrust and everything else, you ought to think about this. Am I trusting God's provision for me? Do I really believe he is overall? Do I really believe that God will take care of me? Or am I doubting God? Because if you're doubting God, you will have no peace. Amen! If you doubt God and his provision for you, and I mean in anything, I'm not just talking about money either. I'm talking about peace of mind, comfort in the Holy Ghost, the work of the Spirit. If you doubt God, then you'll have no peace. Right? It's a song say, stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, binding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Right? That's, that's what it means to trust God. It doesn't mean you feel good about everything. It means you exercise faith and you believe God. Amen. I'm going to tell you what, I've said it before, I'll tell you again. There's going to come a time in your Christian life where you're, you're going to be tested and you're going to have to exercise faith and you're going to have to believe God above everything. Everything. Everything you see, everything you hear, Everything you feel, everything you think, 
you're going to have to believe God. You're going to have to trust him. Just like Noah did. N Noah had to. We're, we're going to talk about Noah, a type of Christ. We're not going to do it today because there's so much. I don't have to, I can't even get into it. It's awesome though. There's good, good lessons there. Christ came from heaven and made the way of salvation. I like this. Think about the ark and think about this verse. Isaiah 43, 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Amen. I'm going to tell you what. Listen to me. You got to go through some waters before you understand this. You got to go through some. You say, wait a minute. Now, how, did, how does Isaiah know that? How did David know that? How did He-Man he know that? How did Asaph know that? How did all those men know that? They went through the waters and God was with them. Man, you got to be tried. You got to be tried through the waters. Well, you got to be, right? Just like when Jesus was in the ship, right? And he was in the ship and it was tossed to and fro. And they cried out, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Well, you got to have a time where you, you go through that, where you understand that, where you deal with that, where you have to trust God. So you, you come to that point. By the way, you're not the only one. Those, those disciples weren't the only one that say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Remember in the Psalms over and over again, Lord, hast thou forgotten to be gracious? Oh, no, he hasn't forgotten. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Amen. Man, I'll tell you what, it's got to get really dark and it's got to get really deep. Sometimes in your Christian life, it's got to get really dark and it's got to get really deep. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. That flood was a picture of death that was coming and is coming upon all of us. And Christ is the only provision. The ark is the only provision. The whole world's going to drown. The whole world's going to go to hell. The whole world's going to die. But that ark, our ark, Jesus Christ, is the way. This is how we're going to, we're not going to, we're not like, um, Ray Kurzweil. We're not like uh, the Amazon Jeff Bezos. We don't have billions of dollars that we trust in, but we trust in the ark, the simple wooden ark, right? That simple one, Christ, who was not comely that any should desire him, right? right? He was not a, billionaires, millionaires, kings of the earth. They didn't have any desire for him. They mocked him. They scoffed him, yep. just like they mock and scoff him today, yep. right? They do the same, but to you, he is precious. Amen? To you it is, because at that dying day, when you're ready to die, that ark is going that ark of Christ to face death, you will face it. You will face it. You will face it with dying grace. Amen. The ark was God's provision for Noah, and Christ is God's provision for our salvation. It is God that revealed his plan of salvation to Noah. He said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. It is the Holy Ghost that reveals the plan of salvation to us. When the word of God is preached, it's the Holy Ghost that drives the truth of the gospel home to the heart. Amen. It is the Holy Spirit of God who reproves and rebukes the world of sin, right? And, and, and shows you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is, the, it is God's spirit that does that. Amen. And just like God's spirit, just like God spoke to Noah and said, Noah, build an ark. God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Noah, it's time to build an ark. It was God's plan, not Noah's. We call it Noah's ark, but it's really God's ark that Noah built, right? But isn't that like our work for the Lord? We are laborers together with Christ. We are co-laborers with Christ, right? So we do work and we work with our hands, but it is God that works with us. Somebody asked Spurgeon one time, uh, they asked him, how does one man get all this work done. He said, you forget there's two of us. Right? Because it's the Lord. This today is the Lord's work. Right? Amen. Now, he told them to pitch it within and without with pitch. This is, this is that, 
tar type pitch, okay? This is, this is somewhat of an example of what you would have used uh, from uh, resin and different things. I'll explain that. It's the resin or pine or turpentine incipitated using, used in caulking ships and paying the, pay, paving the sides and the, and the bottom. Okay, so this is this is not the same stuff, but it's kind of a picture of what we did here. We were sealing this up, right? This is a rubberized seal. The other one wasn't. It's more of an oil based, right? But this is like an, a, a rubberized type seal that we sealed up this wall, right? For moisture and for other things. Well, there was a reason why God had them pitch it within and without with pitch, right? There's a, there's a reason for that. You can't read this very well, but I just put it in there so I could read it a little bit here to you. But it talks about in reference to using the overlaying the woodwork. It's like an asphalt, right? An inflammable substance which bubbles up from the subterranean fountains in liquid state. So they found this. No one knew where to get it. Kind of shows you there was, you know, intelligent beings back then and they weren't knuckle draggers. Like they actually, they God gave them wisdom and he knew that he had to go get pitch, right? Uh, in the latter state, it is very tenacious and was used in, as a cement in lieu of mortar in Babylon, right? As well as for the coating of outside vessels and ships. Josephus talked about that, and particularly for making the papyrus boats of the Egyptians watertight. So the goal of that pitch, pitch it within and without, was, um, was the goal of that was to keep it watertight. So water could not get through there. But the inside of it, the goal for the inside of it was to keep the smells out from the animals. Because you would have the lower levels, you'd have the animals on different levels. And if you pitched it inside, the odors would not be able to escape as much out and go up. So they wouldn't smell the odors of animals and everything like that. People wonder, because nobody ever pitched the inside of their ships. But God told Noah to. You know, that's a picture that sometimes God tells us to do some things that the world thinks is absolutely crazy, doesn't he? But God knows what he's doing. Amen. And that's why they did it that way. You know, um, you have Ken Ham in, in, in Noah's Ark, and, and his, his, he tries to explain some of the ways that things are done and some of the ways that could have, it could have happened. I don't, I don't have any problem with this, trying to explain that, except if it goes contrary to the Bible, then I have a problem with it. Trying to say, this is my conjecture, this is what I think, there's nothing wrong with that. You can, you can say that as long as you say that. But if you say, this is how it was done, this is that we don't know that. God didn't tell us that, right? So we, we're not prophets like that that, have, that that can say that we know exactly how, how that happened in that sense. We don't know. God didn't tell us. However, I don't know all the ventilation system and everything that God used and how he did it, but I know this. It was a miracle, right? That's how I know. How do you know it's a miracle? To put four couples in a boat together and them not kill themselves for that amount of time is a miracle, yeah. right? It's a miracle. It just is. Don't you think? Yeah. You just have to hang around people long enough. You'll figure that out. It's an absolute miracle, right? But anyway, they, the, the point is that it was a miracle because gathering all the animals, all of it was miraculous. I don't have to explain the miraculous. And guess what? I don't have to preach to somebody's brains that wants me to try to explain to them how God did all these things, just like I can't explain the virgin birth except God did it, Amen. right? Some, some of these apologists have a problem. Yeah. They, they want to they wanna over explain everything to make sure they think that they can, some of them think, and I'm not going to make a blank accusation against all of them, but some of them think that they can, they can, they can uh, give people enough facts and give them a way of enough to understand that, that they'll just accept the gospel because of that. Well, I've seen that this is possible. Well, you know what? The mi miracles are about things being, that, that suspend natural law. And everything about Christianity is a miracle and suspends natural law. Because that's the God that I serve. He suspends natural law to do what he wants. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And he's going to do it again. Okay. The ark was a place of absolute security. This truth is seen from several particulars. First, the ark itself was pitched within and without with pitch. Hence, it would be thoroughly watertight and as such a perfect shelter. No matter how hard it rained or how high the waters rose, all inside the ark were secure. How's that for a picture of Christ? Amen. The ark was in this respect also a type of our salvation in Christ. Speaking to the saints, the apostle said, your life is hid with Christ in God. You know, Noah and his family, they were hid in the ark from the whole world. They were hid and they were protected. They were hid and they were safe and they were secure. The storms around them were beating the whole world was being destroyed. But in Christ, 
they were protected. No matter what happened. That's salvation, friend. That's Jesus Christ. That's our Lord. That's the gospel we preached. No, that we preached no hurt with the wind and sun, and it was pitched within to take off the ill smell that might arise from the several creatures, as well as for the better security of the ark. Yeah. That was uh, by Matthew Henry there. He had said that last part there. He said, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Rooms. I thought about this, and these are some really fancy rooms that I don't believe they look like, and they took artistic uh, liberties with this at, at the uh, Creation Museum or whatever. But, you know, uh, that's, that's their thoughts of the rooms and different things that were there. And, boy, that's a pretty posh place. I'm not sure if it looks like a cabin rental right there. But, uh, uh, but anyway. <laughs> that's a nice one right there. If you're going on an ark, you might as well do it right. Uh, but uh, anyway, what's that? Yeah, nice pillows and indoor lighting. And <laughs> I'm having fun, but anyway. <laughs> but, but listen, there's a real truth here, though, that God provided rooms as he makes provision for all who are in Christ. You know, when you go home tonight, you have a room. God's Amen. provided you. Right. You have a place to live and you have a roof over your head, right? Amen. And you have food to eat and God's made provision for you. Noah's covenant had rooms, but I thought about the comparison of rooms to what we have coming for us. We have mansions, right? Yeah. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Noah just had rooms. We have mansions. Amen. Right. The old covenant is not as good as the new covenant. Amen. Amen. It's not as good as the new covenant. Right? How much better is the New Testament and the New Covenant made with man? And I also thought about that room when it talks about rooms, that there's room at the cross. You know, if there's somebody here that's not born again by the Spirit of God, they can be saved today. Right. Your sins can be forgiven you. You can be, you can be forgiven of your sins and cleansed of your unrighteousness. You can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. God made that way, right? He made that way for Noah, Right? And he's got a room for you. Amen. And he's got a mansion for you in heaven if you repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's made provision for his people. Amen. God provides. You know, there was a window in the ark. That window is interesting. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. This window is a picture as well of something important. This, the, the light would shine in, right? No matter how dark it got outside and how dark that it was, God provided some of that light to come in for those people so they could have some light. And you know, Christ is the light of the world, right? He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And Christ is that light of the world. And we're those lower lights that burn. But no matter how dark your night gets, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how many storms you're going through, there's light. God never lets the lights go out completely for his children. That's why I'm going to say this very plainly to you, and I've upset people by saying this, and I've scripturally went through the Bible, and I've never seen a saint of God commit suicide in the Bible. I've seen those that were not saints. I've seen those that were of the first three grounds, and I've seen them that didn't endure, and, and not because they, of their strength, but because they, they weren't preserved, right? They rejected the Lord, right? And they didn't. So, but I've never seen that. But what I have seen is, is that men wanted to die and men were discouraged and men were down and men were broken and men wanted God to take their life, but they never took their own life. Amen. I believe that. I, I, be, I believe that. Why? Because I believe that every man that is saved and every woman that is saved by the grace of God has the Holy Ghost inside of them. And when you have the Holy Ghost, by the way, that pitch is a picture of the Holy Ghost as well, because we are sealed under the day of redemption. I forgot to mention that. That pitch is a pitch of the whole is a picture of the Holy Spirit, right? The Bible talks about the sealing. That ark was sealed. That's the Holy Ghost of God, right? That seals us under the day of redemption. You know what? Your night may get very black and it may get very dark and your mind may get very dark and it may be very gloomy and it and, and depressions may take you and you may be taken and you may be uh, feel like as if the floods are going to take you, but Jesus said the floods would not overtake you. He said you would not drown, but that he would make a way for his people that he would hold them up above the water, that he would keep them from drowning, that if they walk through the fire, that they would not be burned, that God would take care of them. And by the way, that's still the same God that I serve today. And I stand here not only upon the authority of Scripture, but also upon the experience.
experience that God has given me, that God will see you through all darkness. There is no darkness that can take the saint and consume them and take them over when the light of the Holy Ghost of God is there. And I believe that. You'll never convince me otherwise. You'll never convince me otherwise. Because I've seen God's hand move and I've seen him work and I've seen him sustain his people and I've seen him breathe life into them and build them up and strengthen them in their most holy faith. Amen. And God will do that with you. Here's the problem. When you, don't, when you feel as if there is no light, it's because you're not near the source. You're not seeking God. Because when you seek him, you will find him when you search with him with all your heart. You will find him. You will find him in the dark. God's not afraid of the dark. God is in the dark. God is the, is the, is the God of the dark and the light. He does, it, light and darkness mean nothing to him. They change nothing about who he is. They have no impact on God. Amen. His power is the same in the dark as it is in the light. It is just walking by faith and not by sight. Has it ever occurred to you that God makes everything dark in your life for a reason so you actually walk by faith? So you mean I could be surrounded and I can be swimming in, in a sea of affliction and, and trauma and, and anxieties and depressions and discouragements and pain and suffering and grief of mine and turmoil and all those things? Yes! And it proves who God is. It proves his character and his nature that I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Amen? Next, we observe that the ark was furnished with a window, and this was placed above. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. The spiritual application is patent. Noah and his companions were not to be looking down on the scene of destruction, beneath and around them, but upward toward the living God. You know why the floods scare you and the waters scare you and the, and the, and the, and the storm scares you? The same lesson that Peter had when he walked on water. He looked away from Christ. He looked away. And in the storm, when you look away, you'll sink. You'll sink deeper in despair. When you look away from Christ, you will sink deeper into despair. That's how it works. Everything in your flesh will direct you to look away from Christ. Everything. I'm telling you, everything will to look away from well there's no hope uh, you're doomed your past sins this and that and all these other things and you're in your your imperfections and your faults and your sins and your failures and everything else you will think about those things and how you have failed uh, god put that window above why so you look to him looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith you're to be looking towards heaven, right? Like my friend Shay says, heaven bound with a hammer down. Amen. That's how you're supposed to be. That's how you're supposed to be. I ask him how he's doing all the time. He says that heaven bound with a hammer down, right? Full speed ahead. Continue on. Amen. So we are called upon to walk by faith. Our, to journey, our journey is to be with our eyes turned heavenward. Our affections must be set upon things above, not on things of the earth. Set your affections, heavenly affections. Good sermon title, right? Heavenly affections. Because that's where your affections should be, is towards heaven. When they are, you won't be as disappointed about failures on earth. Amen. You should be looking unto Jesus. Your eyes should be above. That window was put above. That's a window of hope to let the light in. Amen. God always gives his saints that window. Christ is our ark and he's that window of hope, right? We always have that. We always have that hope in us, right? No matter how bad things get, no matter how dark things get, we have that hope, right? We have that and you should have that and you should be seeking that. You should be seeking Christ for that hope and strength through your trial. You should not be looking to yourself. You should not be, uh, you should not be focused with a morbidity upon yourself. The greatest way for you to fail is to be, and the greatest way for you to sink in despair is for you to be morbid. A morbid look at yourself. You know what a morbid look at yourself is? It's vanity. That's what it is. 
It's vanity. Right? You're literally walking around all day long with a mirror in your hand looking at yourself. Only you're doing it in your mind. You've got a mirror in your mind and it's, it's mirrored back at you. And you're just looking at yourself and you become very morbid. So in the storm, you become very morbid. Why? Because you're looking at yourself. Look to him. But when I look to him, I see all my failures. Good. But when you look to him, see Christ. Because Christ is greater than all your sins. Christ is greater than all your failures. See, that is the answer. Yeah, but what about this? And I did this. Wait, you, you still got that eye problem. You got to get rid of that eye problem. Right? He must increase and I must decrease. He must increase and I must decrease. Genesis 6, 16, a window shalt thou make to the ark and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. There's something about that I'm going to show you. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. This is, I, I like, this is the one thing about that, the ark that I do like is that door. I like that when I, when you think about how big that door is there, I think it's, I, th I think it is, is incredible, right? But you see that big door there. Christ is the door. Christ is the door. Jesus said in John 10, 7, then said Jesus unto them again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Amen. Christ is the door. John 10, 8, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. That's powerful. There was one door to that ark and one door only. Jesus didn't say, I am a door, did he? No. He said, I am the door. There isn't more than one door to heaven. There is one and one only. And that door is Christ. He is the door. Amen. Christ is the door to eternal life. He is the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. If you found Christ, you found the door. Amen. Christ is the door. Think about that powerful thing. There was one door there. It was God that opened and shut that door. It was God that called men in. It is Christ that calls men, right? It is the Holy Ghost of God that calls men. It is God that's in charge of the door, amen? It is Christ who is the door, right? It is Christ and Christ alone. You know, Noah, we'll talk about this maybe next week, but Noah wasn't in charge of the door. Noah didn't shut the door. Great Noah God didn't, did. yeah, Noah didn't <laughs> shut the door. Good. Noah, God didn't put that on Noah's conscience to shut the amen. whole door. right. Right? No, God said, no, I'll shut the door. Yeah. You go in. You go in. Amen. Proving to you that we can preach the gospel and point men to the door. But they won't go through it. Right. If they won't repent, God will shut the door. There's coming a day when that door for them is going to shut because they refuse Christ, right? Not because God is unjust, but God is holy and righteous and right, right? Look how big that door is. It just signifies room, right? There's room, right? Christ is the door of the sheep. He's the door to the sheepfold, right? And there's room. Amen. If you're lost, you don't have to be. You don't have to die that way. You can be saved. Amen. Jesus is ever merciful. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again from the dead. Amen. He died that you may live. And there is the door. Don't be concerned of your worthiness. You have none. 
Christ is worthy. You have none. Admit your unworthiness. Right? It's like even with saved people sometimes, they, they fight with the devil about their worthiness. Well, you never had any in the first place, so just let that all go. You don't have to get in a fight with the devil. You can agree with him because Christ is worthy. Your life is dead and hidden Christ. Right? People out there looking for their identity. My identity is in Christ. Look at this, though. Even the door was placed as a prophetic picture of Christ. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. I thought about that being a picture of heaven. There's three, right? The three, um, right? Uh, the three, the third heaven, right? Lower, second, and third. Isn't that something? It's something to think about, isn't it? But look at this, though. Here's the picture. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. The door was put in the side. Jesus' blood came out, right? They pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Jesus is that door. He's that door of the ark, right? Where all are safe that are inside. Genesis 6, 17, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under the heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. I want to talk to you a little bit about this here. A little bit of practical application here. It's God that brings judgment upon the world. It is God that's going, to, uh, that's going to melt the earth with fervent heat. It's Jesus that's going to come back and burn up his enemies, right? It's Jesus that's going to come back again, and he's going to destroy them. It's Jesus that there's a judgment seat coming where all men are going to be judged at that judgment seat, right? The white throne judgment. All sinners will be judged there. They will stand, and then there's a judgment of the saved, which is a reward seat, right? But right here, right here we have a principle here that you and I should never forget. It is God that brings the flood. It is God that brings it. This, this as a child of God, you have to remember this as well. That when, when the floods of life and the trials of your life come, when, when, when the rain pours, when things get rough and things get, it is God that sends it. You must believe that. You must believe that nothing is an accident. You must understand that it's God that brings the floods upon the earth. It is God that brings our trials. It is God that uniquely fits our trials. The trial you are in right now, the multiple trials that you are in right now, they are brought by God. They are not, they are not brought by the devil. They are brought by God. God is trying you. And I talked about this Wednesday, but I want to say it again because it matters with this study that we're doing right here, is that if you're not careful, you're going to give credit to Satan for everything that happens in your life. You're just going to blame devils. I'm, I get concerned when I hear preachers always talk about the devil attacking them. I'm not saying the devil doesn't attack us because I know he does. I've been attacked by the devil. But here's the thing. When you find yourself and you believe that everything that happens in your life is, and everything that happens in your ministry is just a direct attack from Satan all the time, you got to be careful about that. you got to be careful about that. So God's never trying you? So, so God isn't trying me? Right? I know that in a trial, I'm, I know five years ago, I was attacked by Satan. I believe that directly. I, I do believe that. But I believe afterwards, I believe that attack was over. And then I believe God tried me. And it is God that tried me. But God allowed it to happen for a reason. It is God that tries his children. And if you forget, if you lose sight of that, and you actually believe that everything's done by the devil, like everything in your life, every bad thing that happens, it's the devil or some demons attacking me. Really? So God's never trying to teach you? As a father, he's not trying to teach you anything. He's not trying to teach you because I could sit. Honestly, there are many times, and I'm not saying Satan doesn't afflict us because the Bible tells us that he does. But what I'm saying is, is that I can show you in the Bible that when things have happened in your life, some of the things that have happened, they've happened because you've made some bad decisions. Amen. I mean, you just plain made some bad decisions. I, 
have just plain made some bad decisions. And God has taught me through those bad decisions. Will we give God the glory or are we just going to blame, are we going to be like charismatics and blame devils for everything? Right? Because right? man, you never have to get, you never have to grow in grace and get right with God if you just blame the devil for every trial you ever have. Right? And you're never going to grow then. Because you're not, God's not, no, no, God. So what you're doing is you're saying God's not trying you. Yes, God can use the devil to try you. Of course he can. We understand that. We see that in Job. But you realize that that's just like the first two chapters of Job. After that, Satan is not around anymore. Right. Yep. God's trying Job. Yep. So then maybe a more profitable thing would be, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Amen. Come on, preacher. I want to give you the glory, God. What are you trying to teach me? Don't you be a stubborn, rebellious little child and act as if God doesn't have anything to teach you. Shame on you to even think that. That you think that the things that happen, shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord and not evil? Right? So we think that, well, every bad thing's never supposed to happen to us. Really? So God's never trying to teach you anything? Like, if you have financial problems or everything else, it's not the devil attacking you. It's actually because you wasted too much money? Like, maybe it's that. Like, maybe, maybe that's, maybe God's trying to show you to stop spending so much money. Right? I'm using that as an example. But it, whatever it is. Or Satan's attacking my health when I had six cheeseburgers. I mean, no, maybe I should should have just had one. Maybe that maybe that's not the devil of, or the devil of cheeseburgers or craft. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe that's not the devil of saturated fats. Maybe that's just me. God wants to Come teach on, me temperance. Like maybe God's trying to show me that, guess what? You can't do that, right? Amen. I mean, I, I'm, I'm telling you, every time something bad happens in a ministry, in, even in the ministry, you have to be careful. God brought me through a lot of things. And I'll tell you when I believe it's Satan and, and, and when I believe why and can show you, right? Some of those things. But also, you remember through those things, I told you that God was correcting me and teaching me. And God was teaching me things and showing me where I was wrong and showing me what I had to get right about and showing me how to mature in the faith and how to walk with God and how to trust him. And I'm telling you, if you forget that it's God that brings the floods, if you forget that it's God that brings the flood of waters into your life, then you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be self-righteous and you're going to think, well, I'm in a righteous cause against Satan. So yeah. I'm just going to keep going. Well, maybe God's trying to teach you some things. And in anything, which one gives more glory to God? If we focus on Satan or we focus on our Father in heaven and the lessons that he has for us. I'm telling you. And by the way, I see people that come from charismatic churches and they, they come out of that mess. They still have that tendency to believe some of those things. They still have the tendency to believe that it's always the devil attacking them, that it's always Satan attacking them, that it's always this. Never the consequences for, bad action, for, for poor actions. Never life just challenges, just life, period. Just life, like everybody has to live, right? Amen, right? And that God is trying to teach me. You know what? I'll tell you what. When you think that, when you think it's always just the devil, that those are the hardest people to teach. You gotta let them. You gotta let them cook in the fire more because they're they're they ain't gonna listen to you. No, it's not always the devil. It's God teaching you something. You know what? There's so many practical. Man, I can't stay on this forever. But there are so many practical lessons. What slide number am I on, Brother Andrew? How many do I have? I have four. Oh, I'm not bad. Okay, we'll we'll make it here. Lord willing, we'll make it. Um. But here's the thing that, that there's so many practical lessons that God teaches us that in our situation when we're going through severe trials, even with depression and anxiety and all those things and different things like that, but not only that, just health needs and everything else. There's so many different things that we go through, right, in our, in our lives that there are practical things that God wants us to learn. Amen. You know, I find that, that one of those things is, is, is we've been too hasty. And we've caused bad things to happen because we were too hasty. We just, we just grew impatient with the Lord, grew impatient with our situation, grew impatient and became hasty and made hasty decisions. And now we're paying the price for those hasty decisions. And then we don't like to, so Satan's a good target. We'll just blame him for it. Yeah, that's right. So we'll just blame him for our bad decisions. Right? Amen. 
there's there's a lot of times there's so many practical applications that God allows that flood to come. You know what? What I one of the one of the main lessons God taught me through some of that is is um, slow down. Think. When everything feels like it's going like this and everything is going like this, you need to slow down. You need to reflect. I find that what we do as as Christians many times is we slow down when we're supposed to obey and we know there's plain truth there and we speed up in a hasty decision. Amen. That's what we do. So we don't reflect enough on serious decisions. Yep. But wh- but on hasty ones, we run straight through it. Only to find out, man, that was really bad. Mm-hmm. That's called immaturity. It's immaturity. It's immaturity of the faith. Right? It's growing impatient and not trusting God for certain things. Right? You may trust him in other things, but not in certain things that you need to. And you grow impatient. And when things are moving too fast and everything else, it's time to do some reflection and slow down. There's been a time in my ministry where I've had to stop doing things. I mean, dead stop doing things and be like, you know what? I got I to stop. Things are not going the way they should. I need to reflect on some things, slow down, take care of my family. Uh, take care of the church, take care of some issues that are going on, and then we'll pick it back up again. You learn that through failing. You learn it through failing. I learned it through failure. I wish I could tell you I learned it because, man, I'm a pretty wise fella, and I just (laughs) picked it up, and you losers don't have it. But I, but I, I can't say that. I learned it through failing. I learned it through making mistakes, repenting of those, reflecting on those, thinking about those, right? God brings the floods. Now, learn what he's trying to teach you from them. Because he is trying to teach you. And it's rarely what you think it is. You think it's all hell, damnation, destruction. God's done with you. He's going to drown you. He's going to hold you under the water long enough for you to drown. And everything's bad. And God hates you. And so does your mother. Well, that, that's, that's literally what goes through your mind in all about three seconds. Maybe more, maybe less than that. But that's where your mind goes with that. Okay? But that's, that's not the case. No, God's trying to teach you something. Would you mature up and learn the lesson God's trying to teach you and stop being a little whiny baby that thinks your daddy don't love you anymore? Amen. Ouch. I say that upon experience. <laughs> because I know it. Right? The minute we get into trial, that's what we do. Well, yeah, my Father in Heaven must not love me anymore. I must not be God's. I must not be, really? Well, maybe God's trying to teach you something. You don't want to learn? Okay. Into the fire you go. Right? Burn a little longer. Cook a little longer. Right? Amen. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Outside that flood, God sent it. By the way, when you die and go to hell, it's a judgment of God upon your sin. If you don't trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's your sin. And it's God's judgment upon sin. And He is righteous and He is just to throw you into hell. He is absolutely righteous to do that. But with thee, that's a great word, isn't it? That contrasting word, but... In the midst of all destruction and all things, God always makes a way. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. That's interesting. Male and female, right? God makes sure they... Second witness, that's right. Because, you know, if all guys went on the ark, that wouldn't have worked. Right? So, gender does matter. No. 
<laughs> eight guys on the ark by themselves without wives. Oh, man. They would have definitely killed each other. But <laughs> no, but they, they shall be male and female. Right? God, God's order is still there. That's God's order for marriage. God didn't change it. He made sure he made provision for it to populate the earth. By the way, that word establish is interesting. Christ is our established covenant. Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Amen. Jesus Christ, the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. I like that. Amen. For, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Right? You can't be saved by the law. You can wear it. If you're, if you're a Christian... Back on. There we go. Now we're back on. Okay. All right. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Amen. God made the way. The ark was the way, right? Come thou and all. It is God that called them. He didn't say go, did he? I like what A.W. Pink says about this. This ark was like the hulk of a ship. Fitted not to sail upon the waters, there was no occasion for that, when there should be no shore to sail to, but to float upon the waters waiting for the fall. God could have secured Noah by the ministration of angels without putting him to any care or pains or trouble himself, but he chose to employ him in making that which was to be the means of his preservation, both for the trial of his faith and obedience and to teach us that none shall be saved by Christ, but those only that work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. See, God works in what you're to work out. You'll never get me, convince me to believe in a gospel that doesn't change someone, where God doesn't save their soul, put his spirit inside of them, and that doesn't work out. It's, it's, it just doesn't work. It's not, it's, not, it's, it's not consistent with the scriptures, right? The good ground produces good fruit. Amen? Amen? It just does. Now, some 30, some 60, some 100, but it produces fruit. Amen. We cannot do it without God, and he will not without us. Both the providence of God and the grace of God own and crown the endeavors of the obedient and diligent. See, this is that Bible verse that we talked about when we, when we were studying Canaan, conquering Canaan, how God saved them and God gave them the victory, but he made them work, right? He made them work. Not to earn eternal life, but because they were his children, they would produce fruit. And God does the same thing with us. Noah built that ark. He was obedient. And he built it. He was obedient to the Lord, right? And God does that in his people, right? That's what he does. He works that into them, and they work it out. It's because of the Spirit of God. It's because of the power of God. That's what he does. That's how God works. Observe that the Lord does not say, go into the ark, but come. Go would have been a command. Come was a gracious invitation. Go would have implied that the Lord was bidding Noah to depart from him. Come intimated that in the ark, the Lord would, present, would be present with him 
Is it not the same thought as we have in the gospel? Come unto me, all ye that that come unto me, all ye, uh, and I will give you rest. All you that labor and are and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Right? The Bible talks about that. Right? That God would give us. He bids us come. What does the bride say? Come. Right? It says come. That's the gospel invitation. Come. Amen. God doesn't say go. He says come. Right? Amen. That's God's gracious invitation. By the way, whenever you're going through the storms of life and everything else, God is saying the same thing. Come thou. Amen. I like what he says here. Come thou. God always addresses himself to the heart and conscience of the individual. Yet the invitation went further. Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And again, we find a parallel in the gospel, the grace in our day. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Right? God makes that way for all to be saved. He makes the way. And by the way, that's why it's important for Noah to be obedient, right? Noah was obedient to the Lord and his family followed. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It was, Noah obeyed the Lord. Noah followed God. Noah walked with God, the Bible says. By the way, fathers, if you don't think your walk with God impacts your family, you're not thinking rightly. You're thinking very selfishly. Because you ought to remember that your walk with God impacts your family. What you do matters. How you walk with God, how you deal with your children, how you teach them, how you guide them. Just like a mother, how you deal with your children, how you guide them, how you teach them. It, it impacts their life. It impacts them. Amen? Noah's obedience impacted his family. Right? Because God knew that he would be faithful. Right? Noah had a track record of being faithful. By the way, he proved that too by building that ark, right? And obeying the Lord. Noah walked with God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah built the ark, right? God's people are called to be obedient people. That's why nobody believes a Christian when they're not obedient. Nobody believes they're even a Christian. Why? Well, because to be a Christian is deny your flesh, take up your cross, and follow Christ. When you're not obeying the Lord, nobody believes you're a child of God. That's just, I mean, that's why. Well, the evidence of being a child of God is following God. It's following Christ. That's the evidence. Like, we can't see your heart. We don't know everything like that. But when somebody tries to convince you that they're a child of God and they're living in vilest of sins and they continue to live in them, they shouldn't wonder why we don't believe they're saved. Why would we? The only evidence we have is the way you walk, right? The fruit and how you follow the Lord. I don't have any reason to believe any otherwise. You know what those people should do? They should, they should follow God and they should walk with God so then people wouldn't have a reason to question them in that sense. Right? Because, by the way, the best thing you can do for somebody that's not living for God that claims to be a Christian is tell them it doesn't look like it. That's actually, that seems mean, but it's not. It's very kind. Right? It's very kind. It, it doesn't look like it. Why? Well, Christians bear fruit and they serve God and they follow him. They deny their flesh. They take up their cross and they follow Christ. But your whole manner of life is going the other way. I'm not talking about somebody that sins or fails. I'm talking about somebody that lives that way. And they continue that way. And they walk that way. And they walk contrary to the Bible. Well, the, the kindest thing you could do is say, well, you, you said you were saved, but you really, it doesn't really look like it. Like, there's no evidence of that. Like, what's your evidence? Why do you believe you are? You don't have a desire to walk with God. You don't have a desire for the Bible. You don't have a desire to live for Christ. You, don't have a desire. you see what I mean? We don't have this like mystical thing called faith that's like this invisible thing that's based on nothing. Our faith is based on Christ. Our, our faith is the faith of Christ, right? It's found in the scriptures. There's evidence to that faith. That's the way it works. Amen? That's the way it works. And take thou unto thee of all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. You know, in Christ, as in the ark, all our needs are provided for. 
aren't they? You say, there's things that I want that I don't have. Well, that's not a need. But maybe if you ask, for the, ask the Lord, he'd give it to you. Right? But look, God made provision. Right? Thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. In Christ, we have that. We, we cry out to Christ, give us this day our daily bread, right? We cry out to God. All our needs are supplied in Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's all our needs are met in Christ. All that we need is in Christ. Just like that ark, right? Just like that ark. All they needed was in the ark because God was there. When God is with you, that's all you need. He'll provide everything else. He'll take care of you. He'll meet your needs. He'll give you everything else. Genesis 7, 16, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded. As God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. We're shut into Christ. Never to leave. Right? Once you're saved by the grace of God, you're always saved by the grace of God. And you stay saved by the grace of God. It's the doctrine, doctrine of preservation. Right? It's the doctrine of sonship. When the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Right? That's right. I and my Father are one. The Bible says that the Lord is the one that closes that door, right? He's the way in and out to find pasture. Genesis 7, 17, And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bear up the ark. Think about this, and it was lift above the earth. Another picture of Christ, John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The ark was lifted up above the waters, not drowned. A picture of Christ being lifted up on the cross to die for our sins. Amen. To provide the way of eternal life. Amen. I think that's it, isn't it, brother? Yeah, amen. So this is, this is the crux of it. Christ is our ark. And the only way you can be saved is through Christ. He gave us so many pictures in the ark of who he is, of his provision, of his care. So today, whatever, if it's salvation that you need, then run to the ark, run to Christ, for he will save you. Amen. He bids you to come. If it's provision and care for your needs, for what you're going through, the trials that you have, the challenges you have, the heartache you have, the pain you have, the suffering you're going through, the things that you need, then you come to Christ. Right? If you are saved, you're already in the ark. You need to believe your heavenly father. You need to believe his provision for you. You need to believe his care for you. You need to trust his care for you. You need to believe that he knows best. You need to believe that everything that you need is provided for in Christ. Everything. All of your needs are provided for in Christ. There isn't anything that you need right now that Christ has not made provision for. There's nothing. Nothing. Whether life, whether death, matters not. Right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord, right? Nothing can separate us. God has made that provision. The children of God need to remember that. And they need to pray to their Heavenly Father. They need to go to Christ. They need to, they need to, they, they need to believe God's promises. And they need to trust Him. Whatever it is that you need. Maybe it's a wife you want. Maybe it's a husband you want. Maybe it's, maybe it's a family you want. Maybe it's children you want. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a job or financial care. Maybe it's depression or discouragement that you're going through or distraught. It, w whatever it is. Maybe you want your children to be saved or you want your family to be saved. All of that is found in Christ. God made provision for everything. There was nothing that they did not have in that ark that they needed. Nothing. And it was all sealed with the Holy Ghost. No water got in, no floods over, overpowered them, overcame them, no one drowned inside that ark. All were safe. But if you're here today and you're not saved, 
the lake of fire, you will drown. There is a judgment coming upon all men, for that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You will die and go to hell, and you will deserve it. God is just and holy. He is righteous because he made a way. Christ is that prepared ark that was prepared for us, right? Christ was prepared for us. He came and he was in, incarnated and became a man, right? And he became a man in a tabernacle, right? That, that the Father made, right? For him and prepared for him in the day that he came, right? And he came and he died. And he lived a perfect sinless life and he died on the cross for sinners. And he was buried and he rose again from the dead. He made provision for everything that you need today. You need to remember that if you're lost here, you deserve to go to hell, but Jesus Christ paid for your sins. He died on the cross for your sins. And though you were guilty before God, Jesus Christ is innocent. So the innocent stood in the place of the guilty that you might have life. That's what he did. He paid it all. He gave it all. Right? So you could have life. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If the Lord be God, then follow him. And if you are saved, you better continue to trust in God's provision because he showed you over and over again there isn't anything that he cannot provide for you and that he will not provide for you. In mind, in body, in heart, in life, and even for death. He has made provision for you and for all of eternity. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for him dying, being buried, and rising again from the dead. We thank you that he gave us life. But Lord, there be some here that aren't saved. Dear God, they're flirting with hell. They're flirting with eternal damnation. Help those that have never repented and put their faith and trust in Christ alone to come today to the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved by the grace of God. And those that are saved, strengthen their hearts, build them up, help them to see that all their provision is in the ark, all their provision is in Christ, all their needs, all their anxieties, all their fears, they need to take it to Jesus and leave it there. There is no burden that you cannot bear. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all this in heaven too. Strengthen your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.